A few years ago, I stood here with a red marker to show the, the curse, a great curse, the curse of a nuclear Iran. But today, today I bring this marker to show a great blessing, the blessing of a new Middle East between Israel, Saudi Arabia, and our other neighbors. We will not only bring down barriers between Israel and our neighbors, we'll build a new corridor of peace and prosperity that connects Asia through the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel, to Europe. This is an extraordinary change, a monumental change, another pivot of history. But I also believe that we must not give the Palestinians a veto over new peace treaties with Arab states. Sanctions must be snapped back. And above all, above all, Iran must face a credible nuclear threat. Welcome back to the Professor Penn Podcast, Episode 64, War in the East. David Penn here. Glad to be here. Welcome back. I hope you're doing well. Difficult weekend, difficult time. Uh, I want to thank Free People Radio for giving the Professor Penn Podcast this platform. And I want to urge all of you to go to freepeopleradio.com. That's freepeopleradio.com. You can explore the site. And I'm going to make a, a blatant appeal. We're not trying to get rich. We don't want to go broke. We want to add staff so we can create more content. There's opportunities there for you to support these podcasts. There's opportunities for uh, special content that you can get involved in. Uh, I'm not ashamed to ask you to go help. We're a political movement. We depend on your support. Like everybody else in the truth-seeking media, we're risking everything we have to speak with you and form a community with you together. Obviously, our survival depends on it. Well, maybe it's not obvious to everybody, but it's certainly obvious to me because I'm watching world events and I know exactly what uh, they have in mind for me. Maybe they have something different in mind for you. I hope so. I know what they have in mind for me. Target.com, another opportunity for you to support the movement. Everything you need in tires on one website, major brand, low cost, lots of American-made product. The best price in the industry, we're going to be out there at MAP. That's manufactured, authorized pricing. Can't come any cheaper. And we will ship the tires at no charge to the installer right by your house, five minutes away from your house. You'll make an appointment. The tires will be there. You pay tire, get $25 a wheel for a mount, a balance, a new valve stem and disposal. And at that appointed time you go there, it's a cashless transaction. Your tires are waiting for you. They put them on. And away you go, and you're a tire get customer. You got to buy your tires from someone. You buy them from us, and you fund the movement. And thank you very much for doing so. PrecinctStrategy.com. We always are promoting PrecinctStrategy.com because it's a tutorial for each one of us about how we can get into the game, get off the bench, and get a seat at the table in the game of politics. You know, I was telling. Uh, Mrs. Professor Penn, before I started these podcasts, before I started this whole journey, that I had to get involved in this because I felt it was my moral obligation, that I had a, a, uh, a reason for doing it. And I didn't really talk to her too much about the reason, but I'm going to share it with you. And I've said it before. I've had um, supernatural experiences in my life. And uh, we'll talk about it more if we live to stay together. I know that sounds a little bit grim, but look what we're dealing with here, which we're going to talk about today, war in the East. But I, I had an experience which um, I knew I was told, I heard, I will restore your body whole for my work and your enjoyment because I was in a tough spot. And um, I was restored and uh, took my enjoyment up front. And I woke up one day and I said, whoa, that's not a very good contract when uh, one party fulfills and the other party doesn't. I better catch up. So I 
I had to do the work, and this is the work of building this community and of uh, seeking truth with you together. And this is uh, particularly interesting because um, there's a lot of truth here we got to go seek. This is not a simple issue, this Middle East, this war in the East thing. And we're going to start talking about it today, and I, I assume we're going to be talking about it more. I pray we'll be talking about it for quite some time together. So let me start out with a psalm. This is Psalm 34. I think it's appropriate for this moment. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Fear the Lord, you is saints. There is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and who loves many days and that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart, and save such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. I hope that's uh, an uplifting psalm for this difficult moment. Uh, I uh, have been covering the history of Israel, the nation of Israel, ongoingly through these past 63 podcasts. And just in the last podcast, we were covering Benjamin Netanyahu's speech at the UN that he gave three weeks ago. You know, I intuitively knew that something was going on. Uh, if you go back and look at the last podcast, you can see I was really all over this uh, new uh, corridor agreement between India and the UAE and Saudi Arabia and uh, Israel and the impending peace agreement with the Saudis. And uh, although I didn't play the portion of the UN speech where Netanyahu talked about Iran and the Palestinians and his the impending peace deal with Saudi. Uh, I, I did pay, play the long 10-minute piece about uh, Netanyahu on artificial intelligence, but I was aware of what he was up to and what was going on. And um, I woke up this past Saturday morning, and just like you, wow, where did that come from? And uh, where it came from was um, decades of oppression and uh, sectarian violence that has separated the Jewish people from their cousins, the Palestinian people. I mean, we're cousins after all. And, uh, you know, like Democrats and Republicans, we hate each other. I mean, look at our country. We hate each other. 
hatred. All by it, and I have to be careful I say it, so for those who are tracking me, my surveillance team, I'm in no way suggesting violence, but violence is upon us as the American people. And, uh, you know, the Professor Penn podcast is about the people of the world and we, the people of America, coming together and throwing off the yoke of oppression, which oppresses, in my opinion, the Israelis and the Palestinians alike. And uh, you're going to watch me seek truth. We're going to do it together. These issues are so born of an ancient history, which is in large part wiped away. Let me just say this, that uh, we have two groups of people, the Jews and the Palestinians, or as the Philistines, uh, these, these are ancient peoples that have lived together for thousands of years. Uh, let us remember that the Romans uh, brought the Israeli or the Jewish kingdom down. Uh, there was a diaspora. The Jews left the Holy Land. And I was reading today on the Lubavitch uh, website, in preparation for this podcast, I was reading about how the Lubavitch talked about this, and they were very interesting about it. They said that generally when a, a people are defeated and conquered, they had a very Darwinist kind of view of it, interestingly, that the defeated take on the the traditions and rituals of the conqueror or they're killed because their culture was unable to withstand the test. Very Darwinist, the Lubavitch, in this way. But they said that what was unique about the Jewish people, that even though they were conquered, they maintained their traditions, they maintained their history, and they maintained their tie to the land from which they were ejected. Very interesting. I think it's important for people to know that not all religious Jewish people think the same about Israel. Let me just say this right off the bat. We've talked a lot about secret societies. The secret societies that run the Jewish people are the secular institutions of the Israeli military. That would be the Mossad and the Shin Bet, their secret services. That would be the yang side, the yang side of the equation. The yin side are the very religious secret societies of the Jewish people, what we see as the people that are wearing the black hats and the curls on the side of their heads and big beards. And in those secret societies, in the center of them, are very powerful men who act very humbly. Their power is in their influence over the Jewish people. And in those traditions, we have two great groups, the Satmar and the Chabad. These two groups don't agree about Israel. And both of them question the secular nature of the Israeli state. The Satmar do not view Israel as being a legitimate country and want peace with the Palestinians and do not think Israel is legitimate or that the use of force to kill other human beings is legitimate. These people are really peaceful in their pursuit of Torah. And they they believe this because in the tradition, when you study Torah, people are taught that all its paths are paths of peace. So if you're really going to go on that road, you know, F-35 fighters are really not on your shopping list, right? And then there's the Chabad, which is the people that get the most press. Those are the people you see. And they're out proselytizing the Jews to become religious. And they have a nuanced idea about Israel. They believe that Israel is for the, the Jewish people, but it can't be a secular state. So they reject a lot of the trappings of secular Israel. And what you've seen happening and what we covered on the podcast 
we covered the conflict in Israel that was tearing the society apart between the religious, the religious who had outpopulated the secular, and the secular were screaming, it's the end of democracy, and women's rights are going to be destroyed, and gay rights are going to be destroyed because the religious had taken over Israel, and they are continuing to outpopulate the secular. So Israel is, in essence now, a religious state, or at least that's where the direction it's heading. And as such, uh, its character has changed because since the beginning of Israel, uh, in 48 and going back into the 1800s, it was essentially a non-religious Zionist enterprise. Zionism was really socialism or Marxism, and it was a socialist Marxist state of people that did not believe in God. That's who founded the country. And we're going to have to explore together the roots of Israel because what are the root causes here? I have to ask myself. I want to explore with you. But just some, some uh, you know, previews of what we're going to get into. Uh, the British controlled Palestine and controlled much of North Africa. Uh, before the Second World War, it was the Germans who went into North Africa with the Africa Corps, with the famous General Rommel, and gave the British what fur, and the Americans, their first, our country, our first foray into, foray into World War II was in North Africa. Uh, huge battles were fought there, and you know the American armies and the British armies combined to defeat the Germans there, but the whole time, Palestine remained in the hands of the British. For a hundred years previous, uh, there had been a movement to convince the crown to allow Jews to immigrate into Palestine. Of course, during that time, the oil industry was developing. And what do we have, really? We have a, the archetype of the forever war. Israel was formed in 1948. There was a war. There was a war in 52. There was a war in 67. There was a war in 73, 81. Constant wars. And these were wars between the Jewish people, and at first it was with their Arab neighbors. And then one by one, the Arab neighbors made peace with Israel, first Egypt, then Jordan. But the Palestinian people continued to resist. And uh, look at the resistance. And there's so many things that come to mind. I'm going to go way off script in time today. But the images that came out of Israel, for me, were so triggering. I, I, didn't, I haven't slept much. Uh, you know, to see the, the murder or the military execution. I mean, I don't, what words do you want to use? Put them in the live chat. But uh, that kind of killing uh, of civilians, uh, this is a, a no-rule war. I mean, we have these notions about what the rules of war are. And you know what the rule of war is? You're either standing or you're not. That's the rule. And uh, I, we, I mean, the body count is not over. It's up to a, close to 1,000 people were killed in this incursion. Maybe it'll end up being a couple thousand. Uh, you know, the Palestinians that entered Israel killed everybody they ran into contact with. And interestingly, because it's a small community, I mean, I have, you know, emails on my phone that I can read of people that were actually at that rave. And uh, there was 300 people killed in one intersection, uh, which, you know, the, the truth is not really out yet. And uh, there's all kinds of subtext because it was, you know, the Jewish Sabbath in a, in a very important holiday period for the Jewish people. So the, those kids that were at that rave were actually secular, cultural Jews that were not religious. In fact, a rave on that day was actually an affront to the religious. And I'm sure, I mean, I'm going to say it, the religious aren't going to come out and say it, but there's going to be religious that are going to, in their mind, they're thinking, okay, these people got what they deserved. 
I mean, I'm, I'm going to say it. I'm not saying I believe it. I'm saying there are people in the community that have the thinking that as much as they're sad about it and there's murders and killings, why were these young people out dancing like that at a rave fueled by drugs on an important Jewish holiday? And there's, you know, there's, you probably have seen, you can go find it on X. There's a video of the participants in the rave partying and dancing, and you can look off in the distance and you see here comes the paragliders. Well, how do those paragliders know to head for that rave? I mean, they weren't up there looking for a target, okay? They're paragliders. They knew exactly where they were going. Who was in charge of that intelligence? Where were the guns? You know, um, I have a cousin, first cousin. I grew up with them. I'm in America. My family came to America before there was a state of Israel. My family settled here. I've said on this broadcast, on these shows, that my parents were leftists. My mother was a communist, is a communist. I got a daughter, daughter who's a communist under my mother's influence. My father was raised deeply religious. He fell in love with a woman who was a communist, gave up most of it. But hey, you can't get that kind of religion out of your soul. So I know who my father was, loved my mother, always wanted to go to Israel. My mom wouldn't let him because she rejected Israel precisely because of the oppression of the Palestinian people. So that's where I grew up. I grew up in that kind of environment. And uh, I do remember in 67 how proud I was as a young kid watching the Jews, you know, defeat uh, the uh, Syrians and the Lebanese and the Jordanians and the Egyptians in one battle. And how proud I was in 73 again when Ariel Sharon surrounded the Egyptian Third Army and saved the day and turned uh, defeat into a great victory. I mean, these things are in my memory. They're not going away. Uh, but these, these guns, where were these guns? I mean, we have this image. My generation has this image. My cousin made what's called a Leah and went to the country of Israel because every Jew can return there if they can. If I can prove I'm Jewish, I can immigrate there tomorrow. It's open for all Jews. That's their law. And he went there, and he was a rabbi. My father and my and his sister were both raised very religious. My father became a secular humanist. And he used to call himself a logical positivist. You can look that up. And although he claimed that he wasn't religious, I know that he was. But my, my aunt, her kid, he went to the West Bank. He was a rabbi, and he carried an Uzi with him wherever he went. Okay, that's my generation. These young people that we have the images of them running across the desert like a herd of zebras running from lions. So upsetting to me. Where were their guns? Where were the guns at these settlements? There was no guns there. These people could not defend themselves. And for, for me, I'm just going to talk about for me, this violates everything that I thought I knew about what was going on there, which obviously I have no idea what's going on there because I had this image that everybody carried a gun. None of these people had guns. They were slaughtered in their homes like cattle. And that is so horribly upsetting because I am part of that nation, the nation of Israel. That's, that's who I am. This is forcing me to clarify all my thinking. So you have this situation where these people are slaughtered like this and uh, they don't have any guns. They're walking distance to that wall, and they don't have guns. What, what is that? You know, so in other words, they were not there for military reasons. They were not there for religious reasons. They were there for a low-interest loan on a fantastic house in the countryside. And that did not work out for those people, did it? And where was the military? Well, that's a an issue for another day. Let, let's just go into this 
And let's, uh, under war in the East, Tanner, um, good morning to you. Good morning. It's not a great morning, is it? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay for you. For me, it's not that great. Let's look at this clip on the corridor. West Asia shined big in the G20. The Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman was in New Delhi. MBS, alongside the UAE's top diplomat, launched a project. It is a corridor from India to the Middle East to Europe. Now, this is aiming to counter China's Belt and Road Initiative. What does this mean? What is the difference between the two projects? We tell you. Last week was big for West Asia. Leaders of Saudi Arabia and Turkey were in New Delhi to take part in the G20 summit. While the meeting in itself made headlines, there was a mega announcement on the sidelines with special focus on West Asia. Narendra Modi, Joe Biden, Mohammed bin Salman and Ursula von der Leyen were seated on the same table when they announced the launch of the India-Middle East-Europe corridor. The project aims to improve connectivity across the three regions. The IMEC will connect West Asia to India and Europe via rail and port links. US President Joe Biden has called it a big deal. The Americans are counting on it to come to China's Belt and Road Initiative. But the other members of this developing corridor believe otherwise. This is an initiative of very important countries who all see good in it for themselves. They're not doing it because they're against somebody and something. They're doing it because they are for something. The White House has said that the project will usher in a new era of creativity. The US plans to show that it can count on its West Asian allies in efforts to contain China's rise. But is that the case? Because Gulf nations are gradually moving away from the American hegemony, China is among the biggest emerging partners. China's Belt and Road Initiative, that experts say might be a threat from IMEC, is too expansive to be tackled. China launched the massive infrastructure project in 2013 and has poured around $1 trillion into its projects so far. While the US might have its military presence, Beijing remains the highest West Asian investor. China has invested in Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, UAE and even the semi-autonomous Kurdish regions. And despite the regular hiccups along the BRI and its not-so-regular pushing the country's deeper into debt outcome, the project's footprint is only growing. In 2022, West Asian countries expanded their cooperation with China and received about 23% of Chinese BRI engagement. It was a 6.5% jump from the previous year. For Gulf powers, the new project is not about choosing sides, but pushing their agenda, that is, better connectivity to the world. Two West Asian nations part of the new corridor, UAE and Saudi Arabia, are members of the BRI. But Gulf powers believe it is time they establish their presence, have their agendas and push the unilateral order away. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. And let's just go right into this Fox News interview of uh, Mohammed bin Salman. The welfare of the Palestinian people remains at the center of talks between Saudi Arabia and Israel to normalize relations. That's according to Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in an interview that aired Wednesday on the U.S. TV network Fox News. The Palestinian issue is very important. We need to solve that part. And we have a good negotiation to continue till now. If those negotiations are successful, Saudi Arabia will become the largest Arab economy to end its boycott of Israel over the treatment of Palestinians, following the recent lead of the UAE and Bahrain. Palestinians widely view those moves as a betrayal. MBS refused to say what concessions Saudi Arabia was seeking from Israel as part of the normalization talks, but said the kingdom was advocating for a good life for the Palestinians. It's not clear at all what he means by that. Uh, does it mean just to loosen some of the Israeli controls, maybe give more aid money, um, freedom of travel? Uh, but the idea of total Palestinian sovereignty in a Palestinian state, those are things that uh, the Saudis have never talked about in any 
kind of detail. The U.S. hopes an agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia can lead to a wider peace deal for the region. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with U.S. President Joe Biden on Wednesday. We can forge a historic peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And I think such a peace would go a long way first to uh, advance the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Iran does not want to see a deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel. President Ibrahim Raisi warned against such on Wednesday. We believe that a relationship between regional countries and the Zionist regime is a step in the back of the Palestinian people. Iran and Saudi Arabia restored diplomatic relations in March. MBS says if Iran obtains a nuclear weapon, Saudi Arabia will do the same. If they get one, we have to get one for security reasons and for balancing power in the uh, Middle East, but we don't want to see that. Finally, when questioned about the 2018 murder of the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi, which a U.N. investigation concluded was likely ordered by the crown prince, MBS refused to say he was involved and called the incident a painful mistake. Well, uh, okay, so we're going to fill this in, but uh, let's just go to the punchline and play this next piece and stop at 25 seconds. Because the Palestinians had veto power over all these peace initiatives in this corridor. And let's just play 25 seconds because it kind of an exclamation point. That uh, girl is a hostage. She went from a rave to uh, captivity. And um, she's a human being, and she's suffering, right? If she's still alive, she's suffering terror that is uh, unmanageable. So what's going on here? I mean, what's really going on? What's what's the real situation? Uh, there's a an alliance in this world that is covered in the U.S. press but doesn't get the kind of um, coverage that it needs. And that's the alliance between Russia, China, and Iran. Within those three countries, that alliance is called the Iron Triangle. And why they call it the Iron Triangle is because it is never to be broken. This is an anti-Western, anti-American alliance that is both military and economic, and it is um, obviously very powerful. So we saw the images of uh, President Modi with MBS and President Biden announcing the formation of this corridor that was intended to move finished manufacturing goods from the country of India by sea, by rail, by sea, to Europe, which is a consumer market, cutting some 40% off the time of moving those goods and putting the Indian manufacturers in a position to compete with the Chinese manufacturers. And for the Chinese, this was a bitter pill to swallow because they have been buying a lot of oil from the Saudis. And as it said in the piece that we played, there's a lot of Belt and Road Initiative investment in the Middle East, and here comes the Saudis cutting a deal with the Americans, the Indians, which India and China have a terrible relationship. Uh, They're on the verge of war at all times. Uh, And it's just a huge affront to Chinese power for the Indians to cut this deal with the Saudis, the Americans, and the Israelis to compete with the Chinese for the market of Europe. I mean, it's provocative. Now, we had the Indian uh, politician on there saying it was not against anybody. It was a combination of countries coming together to do something for good. But, you know, if that was really true, he wouldn't have to say it. This was a rejection of or laying off of bets away from China. And why are the Saudis doing this? 
because nobody knows how this jump ball is going to come out. So they're putting bets down on both sides. They're not picking a side because they have oil. Everybody needs them. So they're playing both sides against the middle. And they're also working towards making a, because this is a new generation of Saudi leadership. And although the previous, since 48, has been the Saudis supporting the Palestinians, at least in words, now MBS was ready to move past that and make a peace deal with Israel because it's about the money, right? I mean, these people wear robes, but they'd look, fine in jeans and t-shirts or in business suits. You know, the costuming doesn't make a lot of sense these days. We can have people that are wearing suits and ties in the halls of the U.S. Congress. They're communists. We just can't identify them. They're globalists. We just can't identify them. So the costuming, which was formerly done to identify people as member of a group, actually now obscures what group people are really playing in. So at the bottom of this, in my opinion, my humble opinion as Professor Penn, knowing that there's an iron triangle of Russia, Iran, and China, and that China was threatened by this new initiative to bring about a higher level of peace and cooperation and prosperity in the Middle East that they weren't involved in, that the Americans had set it up, and their hated enemies the Indians were going to benefit from, Is it possible that they green-lighted the Iranians or encouraged the Iranians to work with their proxies because the payroll of the Iranians is populated by Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas in the Gaza Strip? These two groups, Hezbollah and Hamas, are proxies of the Iranian regime. I mean, you've got to follow the money, right? Is it possible that the Chinese said to the Iranians, undo this peace process, undo this challenge to our supremacy as the manufacturer of the world. Because the Indians want in on that, right? The Indians want in in a big way. And they're actually competing with the Chinese every day, trying to encroach on their markets, trying to manipulate trade policy for their benefit. And so the Chinese, maybe they said to the Iranians, Let's slip the dogs of war, which, of course, they have this capacity that was unrealized. Of course, they knew that the Israelis, as they say, the Israelis, the way they pronounce it, that lived in that southern Israel region close to Gaza, they knew they were unarmed. They knew that the Israeli army was redeployed to handle domestic conflict. Domestic conflict, which we've covered, conflict that was tearing the Israeli society apart about the emergence of a religious right in Israel that was becoming dominant, which, of course, the Palestinians feared that religious right because they're ethno-nationalists. You know, the, the left in Israel had hopes of reaching a two-state settlement with the Palestinians. The right harbors no such aim. So all this is going on. we got to discover this together. And look how we the people play into it. Because there's a punchline I'm going to get to. But this peace process and this economic development has been derailed. As it turns out, the Palestinians did have veto power over that peace process between the Saudis and the Israelis or between the, the creation of this corridor. They've interrupted this process. Who benefits? China benefits. India's a loser. Iran benefits. The Israeli new government benefits because this is going to coalesce the Israeli populace into a community aimed at seeking vengeance against the Palestinian people, which they're saying it's vengeance against Hamas. How are they going to go? They're talking about destroying Hamas. Hamas lives in a, the most densely populated piece of real estate on earth. There's 2 million people living in the Gaza Strip. It's a tiny area, and Hamas is embedded within 
the Gaza Strip within that population? How are the Israelis going to actually go into the Gaza Strip without creating a genocide? And I'm going to say they can't. In the meantime, in our country, whoa, isn't this interesting? Everybody's coming together on this Israel thing, right? Well, who, you know, who's benefiting? The Israeli government is benefiting from an intense coalescing of the Israeli population around survival. You know, me and my cousin against a stranger. Me and my brother against my cousin. I mean, they're getting together. Everybody's getting together on this. And we've had this thing going on for a decade or 15 years about Iran becoming nuclear armed. And look at how our country is coalescing around this Israel idea. Just when the congruency around Ukraine was fraying and people were saying we can't fund this war, now the Israel issue comes up and, oh, both parties are all good. We're going to talk about that. But, you know, there's a lot of beneficiaries here. And I was going to cover this. This is so interesting on my script for today which I did last Friday night before I woke up to this war, I had put in the script that on September 10th, Mossad director David Bardia warned Iran's leaders that they would pay a direct price if Israelis or Jews are harmed in what he said was an ongoing, significantly stepped-up, state-organized Iranian terror effort worldwide. I was going to cover this today anyhow, but now when I read it, let me read what he said. Isn't this interesting? This Barnia Mossad, if you don't know, Mossad is the CIA of Israel. We're talking about the spooky spooks. And these people are capable and they're killers. Barnia said, <clears throat> all of this is under the direction. I'm going to read this. Please let, think about this. It was said about a month before this terrible incursion into Israel. About two weeks before the pending pre peace agreement between Saudi and Israel was announced, be about two weeks before this corridor from India to Europe through Israel was announced. It's about two weeks before. All of this is under the direction and guidance of Iran. We are witnessing a significant increase in attack. And I'm reading this in English. There is a YouTube clip. You can go look at it. One of the things I've committed to do is to talk about where the sources are so you can see it for yourself. This man, his name is Barnia. He's the director of Mossad. The reason I'm not playing the clip is it's in Hebrew. I'm translating for you. All this is under the direction and guidance of Iran. We are witnessing a significant increase in attempts to harm Jews and Israelis around the world. And we are working even now at this very moment to follow Iranian and proxy squads to prevent them from killing Jews and Israelis around the world. The time has come to exact a price from Iran in a different way. Harming Israelis and Jews in any way, by a proxy like Hamas, by Iranians, or by Iranian weapons smuggled into Israel, like those rockets we saw, will lead to activity against the Iranians who sent the terrorists and also against the decision makers from the ground operators to the commanders who approve the operation, to the highest echelon, and I mean that, he said, these prices will be exacted with great precisions in the depths of Iran, in the heart of Tehran, which is the capital of Iran. He continued, the Iranian regime no longer has room for denial, and above all, it no longer has immunity. Our message is loud, clear, and determined to those who have decided to dispatch the terror cells. Be sure that we will get to you and that justice will be done and seen to be done. He's threatening the Iranians. September 10th. September 10th. He's threatening the Iranians. Now, there's people getting killed all the time by these terror cells. In fact, as American citizens, we have no idea how many of these terror cells 
are in our own country because, as we all know, the border's been open. And we know that people from all over the world have come into this country, and nobody knows who they are or where they are. They're here, and what we saw in Israel is very likely to happen here in the United States. We need to get our mind around the fact that we're at war. You know, I do this in my own house. I told Mrs. Professor Penn about a year ago, the world's going to war. She told me I was mentally deranged because I was Jewish and that I took things too seriously. And then the war broke out in the Ukraine. And her comment was, oh, that's the Ukraine. It has nothing to do with us. I said, yes, it does. Well, guess what? When these images showed up on the television screen of what was going on in Israel, Mrs. Professor Penn had a different attitude. She started to say, like, wow, we got three years of food in the basement. How's our armory doing? You know, because really, if you're looking at this seriously, you can see that war is breaking out all over Eurasia. Remember that India and China are basically at war with each other. They just had a throwdown within the last couple of years where they hate each other so much. The two armies did not fight with guns. They fought with baseball bats wrapped in barbed wire. And the Chinese killed a lot of Indian soldiers. It was a major international incident. You probably didn't hear about it. I heard about it because I figure when, you know, hundreds of soldiers put their guns down and fight with bats wrapped with barbed wire, hey, that's hatred. So that didn't go anywhere, but we've got Pakistan, which is on the payroll of both the CIA and the Chinese military, and there's a contested area between Pakistan and India called the Kashmir. We can expect to see, or I will predict, intensified conflict around the Kashmir. And then we got Taiwan. And here we the people sit with $33 trillion of debt, and our country's coming apart at the seams, and we have to ask ourselves, why is this happening like this? Why is our country coming apart at the seams? When war is breaking out all over the world, we're not prepared to fight these wars. Let me tell you, our country's not any more prepared to fight these wars than those Israelis were, that if you go on Acts and look for hundreds of Israeli citizens running across the desert away from these terrorists because they were unarmed and terrified, they are all former soldiers or in the military because everyone in Israel has mandatory military service. So they're all military trained. No guns, running away like sheep. Really? Do you think, do I think, that the Israeli military is going to go into Gaza and be successful fighting people that are willing to die for what they believe in when young Israelis are staying up all night getting high in a debauchery of sex, drugs, and rock and roll? Hey, there's no sex, drugs, and rock and roll in Gaza City. I'm not saying they're not getting high, but they're getting high and talking about killing Jews. They're not getting high and thinking about violating Islam. That's an Islamic enclave. You can tell from how the women dress. So, I am confronted, and I have to talk to you about my own feelings about this. I'm an American citizen. I could have gone to Israel like my first cousin. I never thought about it. I've enjoyed the fruits of being an American. I've enjoyed the freedoms of being an American. My family came to America, and about half the Jews in the world, I mean, this is a broad broad brush, but about half the Jews live in the United States, and about half live in Israel. And those of us that live in the United States always harbored a kind of guilt, kind of a guilt, because we're watching our, our cousins and our family members living in Israel carrying guns and risking their lives. And we're sitting here with manicured lawns, you know, really safe. You live in Israel, you're not safe. Pretty obvious now, isn't it? Pretty obvious. Well, guess what? We're not safe here in the United States either. That is becoming clear. But that being said, I've harbored guilt. Well, I harbor that guilt no more. I'm here for a reason. I'm an American citizen. 
I am an American citizen. And if I'm going to sit here and talk to you and question what is our empire doing arming the Ukrainian Nazis to fight the Russians, would I not also question what my empire, what my country is doing involved in the Middle East? I'll have to, or I'm a hypocrite, and that I will not allow myself to be. So we have to go through this together as a community, and we have to understand that we're bankrupt as a country. We hate each other. Our military is weak unless we unsheath those nuclear weapons. Well, won't that be special, right? Why is our military weak? Why? Our country is weak. Of course our military is weak. We're being fed lie after lie after lie. And we take those lies in as the truth. This is an information war. Everything we're seeing on these screens, all these images, are a carefully curated information war meant to manipulate us in ways that we might not even understand. Like, for example, no guns. Where are the guns in southern Israel? Who are those civilians or those off-duty military people and these people living in these settlements that were unarmed? How could you be unarmed walking distance from the Gaza? Are these people out of their minds? No, they're not out of their minds. They had taken low-interest loans. They have big houses out in developments, and they were depending on the myth of Israeli military and intelligence supremacy in the region. Now, let us not even get in to whether or not this was a false flag or these people were allowed, because all we're doing is speculating. We're speculating. We don't know. So let's not even go down that rabbit hole. Let's just remember what David Barney has said. He said the Iranians would be held to account for any killing of Jews or Israelis. And don't they have a good reason now to go to war with Iran? So we the people, if we're watching Fox News, neocon headquarters, or watching MSNBC military headquarters, or watching CNN, you know, the military industrial complexes, you know, video uh, central. If we're watching this, what do we see? We see politicians of the left and the right of the nationalist movement and the communist movement. Everyone is together, and this is a terrible event. And once we say it's a terrible event and that the Palestinians acted in an inhumane fashion, and the Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders, who's opposed every war since the Vietnam War. I mean, I'm going to get to him, but I got to get to it right away. Bernie Sanders. I'm going to read what he posted on X. We're going to come back to him. I absolutely, this is a quote from Bernie Sanders, who's opposed every war since he's been a teenager. I absolutely condemn the horrifying attack on Israel by Hamas and Islamic Jihad. There is no justification for this violence, and innocent people on both sides will suffer usually because of it. It must end now. But when he condemns the horrifying attack and that there's no justification for the violence, who's he throwing in with? I mean, because there's people in our society right there today, there was protests all over the United States on Sunday in support of the Palestinians. And that was widely reviled. So what we have here is the opening of the second front of the next world war. We have the Mossad on September 10th saying that the Iranians will pay a heavy price in their leadership. Their leadership will be killed for supporting attacks on Jews and Israelis. A month later, a butchery, a savagery, unparalleled in our memory with fantastic video coverage. I mean, these Palestinians are social, social media experts. And all these images are flooding in upon we the people. 
And now every time we turn on the television, oh, we're coming together. I heard one Republican rhino saying, hey, under this circumstance, we got to bring back Kevin McCarthy immediately as Speaker of the House. A week ago, McCarthy was saying, I'm done. I'm out. Oh, he came right out and said, well, if they call on me, what can I do? It's a time of war. I have to serve my country. Who benefits from this? The Chinese benefit. The Iranians benefit. The Israelis benefit. The United States of America. I'm talking about the leadership, not we the people. I don't benefit. When I go to the mall, I'm going to be subject to a terrorist attack. When I go to a big box store that on a Sunday might have a thousand people in it. You know, two guys could come in, bar the front door so nobody can get out, walk through that big box store with a couple of automatic weapons, and kill five, six hundred people in, I don't know, 20 minutes? Who's armed in Costco? Are all the American citizens in Costco packing? Because we better be. We're at war. We're at war. I know some of you haven't come to that realization yet. We don't want to be at war. But we're being led into war by who? Not by me. Some of my best friends are Palestinians. I went out of my way to befriend Palestinians from the time I was 18 years old. My best friend for a big part of my adult life was a Palestinian. I think I've told his story. I won't tell it today. I'll tell it in a future podcast if we're still here talking to each other. And, and believe me, this is not going to go down quickly. It's not like we're going to wake up dead tomorrow, I don't think. This is about control. When there is a massive terrorist attack in Israel like this, the entire Israeli citizenry puts down their divisions, and this society was coming apart at the seams, and they're all united on one idea, revenge. And I'm going to say, how do you destroy Hamas? that's embedded within a population of 2 million civilians. Are we, gonna watch, are we going to support the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian community in Gaza? No, we are not going to support that because it's going to be horrifying and we're going to have all the video and it's going to be very quickly brought into the consciousness of everyone that it's a genocide. So this fight between the Palestinians and the Jews really served to keep the people divided. What we need is unity. In the, So we're having a moment of unity about what? Going to war. Once that's established, we'll be separated again. What they're looking for, I'm talking when I say the, I mean the leadership that works for the military-industrial complex. What they're looking for, what they have, is the justification for all-out war. And the reason there's a war like this is because the globalist architecture is frayed. The globalist architecture is coming apart. The deal, the Kissingerian deal, the Brzezinski deal, the deal that was set at the time of the formation of the United Nations in 45, that was set in 1913 at the time the Federal Reserve was established. This globalist architecture, it's coming apart. It's coming apart. It's a jump ball. And all these different groups are seeking control and mastery of the new world order. We're in the new world order. How does it look to you? Doesn't it look great? Doesn't it look great seeing people slaughtered in their homes, defenseless, by young people who came across a border and within that border is a prison, an open-air prison. Isn't it great? Aren't we having a good time? It's going to get worse. And that, that degradation of American life is going to be used to control us. Scarcity, poverty, violence will cry out as the American people, not for self-governance, but for the government to protect and save us. So the forces that seek to control us, the forces that profit from conflict are being strengthened. 
and why we're doing this podcast, the idea of self-governance, the idea of America as a self-governing community, that's going to be extinguished unless you go to caucuses and become a delegate. I am not a hypocrite. I am not going to support a war that involves Israel any more than I'm going to support a war that involves Ukraine, particularly under the auspices of it's a secular state and it's about the military power of Israel to suppress its, in, its, its neighbors or its, its population. I can't support that. Now, are there righteous elements in this that we could get to as a community? Could we see that Jews and Christians are the same people instead of another Democrat and Republican divide? Oh, Jews, they don't believe in Christ. They're different than Christians that believe in Christ. You know what? I'm on both sides of that football, and I'm going to tell you, there's crazy people on both sides of it, but both sides and the Muslims believe in the same God. So what are we fighting about? Do we believe in God or not? And if we believe in God, what do we believe about that God? This is a religious war. At its base, it's a religious war. But right now, it's secular. Well, a secular war that's about spending money and aggrandizing the military budget. They've already pledged $9 billion to the Israelis. I mean, come on. This is just more of the same BS. This is about we the people, be it we the people of the United States or we the people of Israel or we the people of Gaza. It's about we the people dying. It's about old men in secret societies sending the young and the dumb to die. And they die gloriously. And then we use the, their, their martyrdom, their bravery, their glorious deaths as the totems to hide the inequity of old men that do it for profit and power. This is about profit and power. But down at the base of this thing, this is different. And we're going to have to explore that together. But at the top level, the level that we see, Iran has a GDP of $359 billion. It's supplying China with oil. The Chinese are paying the Iranians for the Iranian oil in the Chinese currency. They've de-dollarized the trade. They pay for the oil in RMB, and then the Iranians buy Chinese finished goods with that RMB. It's what the Chinese call a good circulation. A good circulation. It's happening without any Western globalist involvement. It's its own financial ecosystem. China's trade with Iran is growing. China's trade with Russia is growing. China, Russia, and Iran are an axis of evil, according to our country. And in their country, guess who's evil? That'd be the United States of America. Or as the Ayatollah Khomeini calls us, called us back in 1980, the great Satan. Israel's the little Satan. And while all this is going on, we still have our own political divides, which will be solved under the guise and under the cover of the need to come together to protect and arm Israel. I'm going to say it's LL Cool Matt. You know, we got LL Cool J. Well, ladies love Matt Gates. Ladies love him. And why not? He's charismatic, he's articulate. Let's just say how cool he is, just for a break to lighten up. Play this piece with Wawa Watson, just for a break, just to let, let me lighten up a little bit. Wawa Watson.
Okay, so my point, number one, I haven't been playing music. I'm playing it. If you have things you like to do, do them. Be good. I'm going to try to be as good as I can be and as sin-free as I can be. All the chips are up on the bar here. We don't know how much time we have. We better make good use of our time. And this guy is so cool, Wah Wah Watson. Reminded me of Matt Gates when I saw it. Because Matt Gates brings a little cool to the Republican Party. And guess what? The Republicans don't like that. Let's just play a couple of assholes that are getting down on Matt Gates. Mark Wayne Mullen, Senator from Oklahoma. You know, there's, what are, you know, Oklahoma. Come on. Let's play him. This is a guy that didn't have, that the media didn't give a time of day to after he was accused of sleeping with an underage girl. And there's a reason why no one in the conference came and defended him because we had all seen the videos he was showing on the House floor that all of us had walked away of the girls that he had slept with. He'd brag about how he would crush ED medicine and, and, and chase it with, um, with an energy drink so he could go all night. This is obviously before you got married. All of a sudden he found fame because he opposed the Speaker of the House back in November and he's always stayed there and he's not he was never going to leave until he got this last moment of fame by saying by by going after a motion to vacate it's important to know congressman gates has never been charged with any sex trafficking crime and he gave this statement to cnn in response i don't think mark wayne mullen and i have said 20 words to each other on the house floor this is a lie from someone who doesn't know me and who's coping with the death of the political career of his friend kevin thoughts and prayers <laughs> you know the guy's a senator. He doesn't have anything to do with Gates. And we presume that these people, you know, if they look reasonable in a suit and a tie, they don't lie. Well, you know what? They do. I don't know who's lying. But I know imputing Matt Gates in this fashion just appeals to the purient in all of us. Maybe Matt Gates slept with an underage girl. I I'm not saying he did or he didn't. I don't know. I wasn't there. And I doubt Mark Wayne Mullen was there. But, of course, he wants to get it out for everybody to start to look at Matt Gates, not as an American patriot, not as a person concerned for the American people, but as a person who is a snort and ED medicine and washing it down with energy drinks so that he can go all night. Hey, I'm looking at Matt Gates. Mark Wayne, you might need the ED medicine. I think Matt Gates can go all night without it. It's just my opinion. I mean, the guy's cool, right? But, you know, we're not done. Here comes another old fossil's going to speak against them. This guy, this guy hasn't seen anything below his belt for decades. Newt Gingrich. These are, this is the uni party standing up to knock down the American nationalists. Let's listen to Newt Gingrich. No, but they need to be held to their feet to the fire. Why did they think it was better to be two solid, conservative, continuing resolutions that, as you pointed out, includes... The border includes deep spending cuts. Did everything they claimed there for? You know why they did it? Because ultimately, Matt Gates, who hates, well, let's be clear, he hates Kevin McCarthy, was determined no doubt about it. to find a way to get to today. Let me be very clear. And I think clear. it's disgraceful, and I hope they expel him from the conference. Oh, let's expel him. Just like President Trump's not going to get on the ballot in many states because they're going to imprison him, and, you know, they're, they're work. Let's just take our political enemies and not listen to them. Let's expel them. This is Newt Gingrich. Every, you know, if you don't know him, look him up. He's important. And he's making it, Mark Wayne Mullen made it into a sexual thing. And here's Newt Gingrich making it into a hatred thing. I mean, you know, the guy's got lust. He's got rage. I mean, Matt Gates is anything but a rational actor. Given over to sin. Let's listen to Matt Gates and what he actually said, the words that came out of his mouth. Mr. Speaker, my friend from Oklahoma says that my colleagues and I who don't support Kevin McCarthy would plunge the House and the country into chaos. Chaos is Speaker McCarthy. Chaos is somebody who we cannot trust with their word. The one thing that the White House, House Democrats, and many of us on the conservative side of the Republican caucus would argue is that the thing we have in common, Kevin McCarthy said something to all of us at one point or another that he didn't really mean and never intended to live up to. 
I don't think voting against Kevin McCarthy is chaos. I think 33 trillion in debt is chaos. I think that facing a $2.2 trillion annual deficit is chaos. I think that not passing single subject spending bills is chaos. I think the fact that we have been governed in this country since the mid 90s by continuing resolution and omnibus is chaos. And the way to liberate ourselves from that is a series of reforms to this body that I would hope would outlast Speaker McCarthy's time here, would outlast my time here, and would outlast either of our majorities. Reforms that I have heard some of the most conservative members of this body uh, fight for, and some of the reforms that we've been battling for that I've even heard those in the Democrat caucus say would be worthy and helpful to the House. Well, he's young. He's young, he's vigorous, he's articulate, and he's speaking truth. $33 $33 trillion of debt is chaos, complete and total chaos. And we're plunging into a war with no money, with a huge debt. What do you think is going to happen to we the people? But, hey, we don't want any truth on the Congress floor, so let's say that this is all fueled by sex and rage. Remember, Kevin McCarthy is a sexually addicted Kevin McCarthy. Matt Gates is a sexually addicted, rageful and vengeful human being who should be discredited out of hand because he's saying to the American people, we're broke. I don't have to look it up. I'm going to know certainly that Mark Wayne Mullen has a statement out saying Hamas is horrible in Israel. Go get him. And Newt Gingrich, the same thing. These people are uniparty participants. And what does the uniparty do? It protects the military-industrial complex and the medical-industrial complex. That's what it is. They're all on the payroll, and that's the biggest part of what we the people pay for when we go to work every day. It's our energy that's stolen from us in the form of taxation to fund a system that kills. You know, it used to be that the medical part was, you know, keeping us alive. Well, hey, okay, looks to me, just from my view, that the military part kills, and, you know, what happened to an ounce of prevention's worth a pound of cure? Why are we spending $2 trillion a year on chronic disease management when we could spend just a little bit of money and teach American citizens how to compress morbidity and be healthy their entire lives. Why is that not the priority? Because it would be a lot cheaper than $2 trillion. In fact, I bet you we could get that done for a hundred, couple hundred million dollars of education. Change the culture. You know, if you look down and all you see is your belly, and if you're heavy, I've been there. But if all you can see is your belly, hey. Obesity, obesity is, that's, that's it right there. We got to move. But we don't, we, we're not taught that. We're taught to buy popcorn and, you know, a big diet, a diet or a sugary soft drink and sit down on a chair and watch six hours of football on a Sunday afternoon. Hey, that's what we're taught to do. Matt Gates told the truth. How are we going to go into a war, fund a war in the Ukraine? Now we're going to fund a war with Israel and Iran. And in fact, if that war breaks out, I'll make a prediction. The United States is going to be involved. Well, the United States is already involved because the intelligence services, Mossad, CIA, they're completely integrated. They're working together. Israel is our forward firing base in the Middle East. It used to be a pawn in the British game of controlling all the oil reserves in the Middle East. Let's get everybody hating each other so they're dependent on the power structure. Because after all, when we're all killing each other and there's no food, oh, please help me. And that works at the government level also. Well, we need arms. We need food. We need water. We need medicine. Help us. So who gets the power out of this? The biggest organizations in the world. And that would be money flows uphill and flows downhill. 
Nope, you're going you're gonna to take that one out. Very good. Tanner's all over the top of this. What a producer. And we got here in Minnesota, we got Amy Klobuchar, Senator Amy Klobuchar. Senator Amy, what a genius she is. You know, I've determined the reason she's so successful is because when I listen to her, I go to sleep, I can't hear a word she says. She has a remarkable skill. When she talks, we go to sleep. It's so boring and so, it's just like a sleeping pill. In fact, I'm going to start a new business. We're going to get tapes of Amy Klobuchar. We're going to sell them. People can put their headphones on and listen to Amy Klobuchar, and you'll be asleep in 42 seconds. I guarantee it. I'm going to play a clip. I had to listen to it 10 times to get through it. Here's what Amy Klobuchar had to say. The violence being perpetrated against Israeli citizens is horrific and gut-wrenching. True statement. I unequivocally condemn these Hamas terrorist attacks. Unequivocally. That means there's no countervailing reasons. She unequivocally condemns Hamas. Therefore, she unequivocally, unequivocally condemns the Palestinian people. That's another scam that's going on. I'm going to digress. I've been hearing in the press that Hamas is oppressing the Palestinians in Gaza. Come on. Hamas is the flowering, the, the, the aspirations of the Palestinians in Gaza for freedom. That would be like saying Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were oppressing the black community. I'll have to go back and look at it. I'm sure someone said it. Somebody down south who was a racist. No, Hamas is inextricably linked to the future of the Gazans. I'm going to read this again. The violence being perpetrated against Israeli citizens is horrific and gut-wrenching. Go look at the video. Yes, it is. She continues, I unequivocally condemn these Hamas terrorist attacks. That means unequivocally. There's no countervailing reasons. Unequivocal. The United States stands with Israel. Pick a side. Isn't that great? A liberal. It's so liberal of her. I thought the liberals were for, were for peace. Well, let's see how, how uh, tuned in Amy Klobuchar is. Let's go through a couple minutes of this Klobuchar on Putin, Prigozhin, in the Ukraine, just to see how insightful she is. Let's look at some of her previous work as a predictor of future performance. Extreme in House Democratic Senator Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota. She's a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Senator Klobuchar, welcome back to Meet the Press. Great to be back on. Thanks, Chuck. So let me just start with, um, as you were watching things unfold this weekend, first, did you feel as if you were well-informed? Uh, how much brief, how many briefings have you been able to get? And um, what, um, what do you want us to do? Does this at all shake your resolve about what we're doing in Ukraine? The opposite. Um, we saw here a demonstrable crack in Vladimir Putin's strength. We saw a visible rejection of his war policy by someone who had been an ally, and now it turned into uh, insubordination, taking over a city of a million people, uh, marching his Stop. troops and his... You know, when she talks, the lies pour out of her mouth or the misunderstandings pour out of her mouth. Putin was not weakened. Prigozhin did not take over a city he parked there this is misinformation. And, of course, the senator was emboldened by the Pergogian incident, and she's doubling down on supporting the Ukrainians. Please continue. There's tanks within 124 miles of Moscow. Um, and then you see Putin having to condemn this on their own country's TV. That's what happened. And then on the other side, and by the way, this was a guy that, you know, had hired mercenaries in Syria and Libya, someone that had started an Internet troll farm in Moscow to attack the American elections. And then Stop. on the other side... So she's bringing up Putin funded a troll farm to attack American elections. Great. We funded an entire military operation to kill Putin. Come on. Let's be upfront about what's going on here. You know, 
it, it's so maddening it's hard for me to even comment on it. It's, it's propaganda. Please continue. In Moscow to attack the American elections. And then on the other side, you see President Zelensky, who has governed with moral authority, right. who has brought his people with him, not through Stop. fear. They're pressing people in the military service, like press ganging them, like going to their house and dragging them out in the Ukraine. Jelinski's moral authority? Jelinski, they call him Mr. Ten Percentsky in Europe because he takes 10% of everything that comes in the country. That's right, Mr. Ten, President Ten Percentsky. That's his commission on all this action. Moral authority? Moral authority? What moral authority? The moral authority that our senator here in Minnesota is bestowing upon an ex-actor who was installed as the president in a State Department-run coup, not by the assent of the Ukrainian people, but by manipulating the elections of the Ukraine. On record, easy for you to find. Go to Wikipedia. Look up the Maidan Revolution. Go to YouTube. Look up. It's M A I D E N. It is incontrovertible that the United States, under Barack Obama, destabilized the elected government of the Ukraine as it moved closer with the Russians, destabilized it, installed a new anti Russian government. There's no moral authority. Please continue. But through their own patriotism and wanting to protect the sovereignty of their country. And you now see this counteroffensive. We always knew it would be a slog, uh, but he is advancing. Right. And as of Monday, I think. Stop. Over the counteroffensive was a big nothing burger. You're not hearing anything about it. In fact, the growing dissatisfaction in the American people with financing this war in the Ukraine is guess what? It's back page news now. Now it's been replaced by something we're supposed to all get together on, which is defending Israel. Please continue. Eight towns. Um, having to choose between Putin and Pergozin is not a choice anybody wants to have to make. I mean, uh, you, you look at, at our philosophy in Russia, we fear a strong Russia and we fear a weak Russia. We want something in between because they're a nuclear power. But, you know, what's the best U.S. role uh, the best thing that the U.S. can do to sort of encourage a that Goldilocks approach? Well, um, obviously, the continuing openness to nuclear discussions and nuclear safety, and the Secretary of State uh, and President have assured us that um, there hasn't been any change in that mm -hmm. right now when it comes to Russia. Uh, but the second part, of course— You know, I can't take any more of this because, I mean, come on. You're a U.S. senator. Please don't lie to the people of Minnesota. We've played over and over again on this podcast Russian leadership threatening the use of nuclear weapons. So, you know, this is like an alternative universe for people that go to raves a couple miles from the Gaza Strip without weapons. Trust us. We're your government. Everything's going to be okay. Don't worry about nuclear weapons. It's all good. And as far as moral authority, one other thing I looked up about the Ukrainian people. Six million of the 43 million have fled the country. So not everybody, even in the Ukraine, wants to be in on this war. I mean, when you lose 15% of your population in a mass migration to avoid a war, not everybody's down with it. And as a matter of fact, there's a lot of Israelis living in Israel. I know of some of them. But compared to the Ukrainians, Maybe less than 1% of the Israelis will flee. They're all going to get together. They're all going to get together and fight this thing. Now, now, this Amy Klobuchar, she's not the only one. Tanner, can you put up this picture of Bernie Sanders protesting during the Vietnam War? Let's put this up. Just, yeah, see that picture? That's Bernie there holding the sign, end the war in Vietnam. So from his youth, when he had all of his hair and it was all black, he was fighting the war as a young Jewish Marxist, which is who he is. And what did he write? I'll say it again. I absolutely condemn the horrifying attack on Israel by Hamas and Islamic Jihad. There is no justification for this violence. 
which is like unequivocal. No justification. He's wiped out all the Palestinian explanations for why this happened. He's picked a side. And that would be the military-industrial complex side. In fact, last week, which I was going to cover this before this war started, he had 50 activists in Vermont constituents arrested at a sit-in inside his offices because they were demanding the senator to call for peace and diplomacy in the Ukraine instead of more weapons of war. The, the sit-in resulted in the arrest of 11 activists, including an 89-year-old Code Pink participant. So they already were protesting him for supporting the war in the Ukraine, or at least they, he was not opposing it at the level that they thought was commensurate with his history. Let's look at his history. We're just going to take a little look at it. Here's Bernie opposing the Gulf War. This goes back to 91. Let's pop this one up. Mr. Sanders of Vermont. Thank you. Uh, I ask for unanimous consent to address the body for five minutes. Without Mr. objection. Mr. Speaker, we should make no mistake about it. Today is a tragic day for humanity, for the people of Iraq, for the people of the United States, and for the United Nations as an institution. It is also a tragic day for the future of our planet and for the children, 30,000 of whom in the third world will starve to death today while we spend billions to wage this war, and 25% of whom live in poverty in our own country because we apparently lack the funds to provide them a minimal standard of living. Mr. Speaker, despite the fact that virtually the entire world has been united against Saddam Hussein, a two-bit vicious dictator who illegally and brutally invaded Kuwait, the President concluded that there was no way of resolving this conflict and achieving our goals other than waging a massive war, perhaps unprecedented in the history of the world, in terms of the death and destruction wrought in its first day as a result of our aerial attacks. That's good, Tanner. Well, that's I disagree. Good. So that's Bernie opposing the Gulf War. Now here he is going to be opposing the Iraq War, which was, you know, Gulf War II. Let's pop that up there. Giving the president authority to wage a unilateral war, a preemptive war against Iraq, would be a terrible mistake. This idea is opposed not only by the Catholic Church and the Vatican, not only opposed vigorously by Nelson Mandela, not only opposed by the vast majority of countries in the world, but it is opposed by an overwhelming number of American citizens who say that the United States and the President must work with the international community and must work with the United Nations to allow international weapons inspectors to go into Iraq to make sure that Saddam Hussein does not have weapons of mass destruction. There are many reasons to oppose this resolution, but one that doesn't get enough attention is that with a $6 trillion national debt and a growing deficit with cuts in Medicare, at a time when veterans can't even get treatment in a VA hospital, this operation in Iraq could cost the American taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars, and I think that that is unnecessary. Thank you. Oh, six trillion in debt. Don't we wish we had those days back? We wouldn't even be concerned. It's 33 trillion. And he's using six trillion as a reason not to go to war. Well, somewhere along the road, our Marxist Senator, Mr. Sanders, had a change of heart about the military-industrial complex. Let's pop this one up about Sanders in the Ukraine. I think in this one, really, as somebody who has opposed so many wars of the United States, you know, you're looking at somebody who voted against the military budget. Uh, on this one, Putin did not have to do what he chose to do. Uh, so all I can say is I hope it certainly ends as soon as possible that there's a negotiated settlement. But I think we cannot allow Putin to run uh, roughshod over an independent 
country. Right. And that does mean supplying the weapons that the Ukrainians say they need. Yes. Hey, we're all together now, aren't we? We got the far left and the far right. We're all together on having a war. Hey, we're all together. Are we happy? Are we happy? Well, this is who we are. Let's go out with some uh, comments about harmony. Uh, Tanner, can you play this short quartet with vocals, please? How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. And there the Lord has pronounced his blessing even life everlasting. Harmony is something we work for. I'm going to work for it in my own life. All of us need to pursue it in our own lives. The continuous bombardment of our psyche with the need for war. That is the war, the war for our minds, the information war. Let us pursue peace and harmony in our own lives first. Let us resolve the conflicts in our own lives because conflict is fungible just like that money is that President Biden gave to the Iranians. Harmony is fungible. Let's spread it out. Let's use our power to bring peace into our own lives starting today. Look forward to seeing you on Thursday. And I'm going to go out here with beautiful sounds of gospel music, beautiful harmony to remind us what human beings are capable of. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing you soon again. Steal away, steal away. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. Soon I will be done with the troubles of the world. Going home to live with God specializes how I got over, how I got over, how I got over, how I got over. I'm telling you that I, I won't be back, I won't be back, I won't be back no more. Oh, happy day, oh, happy day. strength of my life through it he all moves all pain misery and strife i've he learned to, keep to trust me, in jesus never to leave me, i have never learned to trust in god on his word do, do, what is this do, 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 i feel do, deep do, inside do, 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 do,
A place where love will never cease to willing to die for Heaven is where I wanna be You brought the sunshine Throughout the lifeline Since that I have found Christ There has been such a change in my life Jesus is real I know the Lord is real to me. The melodies from heaven rain down on me. The rain down on me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. It won't work. Always enough. 